Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Chris Brogan. Hi Chris. Hi Joanna, great to see you. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Chris Brogan is the New York Times best-selling author of nine books, CEO of Owner Media Group, professional speaker and podcaster. His latest book is Find Your Writing Voice. Um, so Chris, I'm super excited to have you on the show because I discovered you in 2009, way back when I started and Trust Agents came out and Trust Agents had a big effect on me. So what you know, the principle of know, like, and trust, why is that still important or perhaps even more important these days? There are a few things at, at play there, Joanna. One is that um, the same tools that make it so easy for any of us to start and run a business um, also allow certain elements to decide whether or not they want to do something dubious. Uh, and, and with all new technologies that comes, you know, there's nothing unique about these new technologies like the social web. Uh, in the 1800s, anyone could put anything in a bottle and sell it to you and say, this is gonna cure everything. Cancer, gone. And the bottle could have nothing, you know, it could be Kool-Aid. Um, and so the idea of trying to understand what's behind a business though, one beautiful thing that's come is that we can see in much more dimensions who we're dealing with. We can understand better uh, who's the face behind the brand. And there's pluses and minuses. You know, there are, are brands that <clears throat> I think execute well, but have leaders who maybe make choices that we don't agree with. Uh, one example is the uh, hosting and domain registrar, GoDaddy. Mm. <clears throat> CEO uh, was. Uh, kind of a good old boy and made lots of sexist comments and statements and people would be upset about that. He was a hunter and uh, it's now no longer vogue to ever hunt an animal. Uh, and, and so he got in a lot of strange trouble uh, for things that I kept feeling like, I don't like that he's sexist, but the service works, mm -hmm. etc. But people were able to see more about him and make choices about him and or whether or not to do business and they, and they voted with their money. I think that that's the probably best uh, good and bad scenario of what these tools allow for. And I think it's really good that we can have some kind of contact. I love that brands make it so that they're a lot more available, so that we can possibly reach someone in an, in an entity and understand something about a product we're considering purchasing, let's say. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I mean, you have a really big audience and you are both, uh, you're both CEO of a, a bigger company, but you're also still Chris Brogan, the personal brand, um, which is the guy I follow. And you have some very practical ways that you actually facilitate this know, like and trust with you personally. Could you share with the audience some of the more practical ways an individual can foster a relationship with a bigger audience? Sure. I'll, I'll clarify one thing. When we say bigger company, I work with very big companies, but my company is three whole people. Uh, <laughs> so it's not very big. Um, I will say that the the things I'm trying to communicate most lately is I, I really want people to try their best to be a lot clearer on what they stand for or what they say. And I don't really mean a tagline. I mean, humans don't really talk like that. They don't throw some sentence out as often as they can so that you remember them for that phrase. No one, no one you worship does that. Uh, but I would say that we have so many uh, media available to us, the plural of mediums, uh, that, that where we can be more of ourselves. And I think that there's a great opportunity to share the you behind the scenes. Um, and some people get, immediately terrified about this. Ah, the last thing I want is for people to know more about me. But I think we have such an opportunity. We have such an opportunity to, to voice our thoughts on something, to talk about the story that goes behind the product. Uh, you know, I'm about to drink some drink and it's, it's a bunch of greens and it says here that there's 4.5 pounds of produce pressed into this bottle, which I don't quite understand, but I'll, <laughs> I'll accept it. But I'm curious who made it. And I think that we not only who made it, but what what do they do when they're not squeezing juice into bottles? What 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 else is impressive, important to them? I was uh, sent a product, a beauty product, that I thought, of course, naturally, people think beauty, they think Chris Brogan. Let's <laughs> send him a bunch of coconut things. Um, and I found all these things. So first, they're in um, Indiana, which is you know, in the United States. It's in the middle of the country. There is zero reason to think that coconut anything is made in Indiana. Uh, and I was immediately impressed. And I, and I thought, 
that's great. So then I went and looked at the videos that they had produced, and they were they were terrible. They were they were produced by uh, old 1990s style uh, video producers. So they had really loud background music, really bad background music that we should be doing aerobics to, perhaps or something. I don't know. Uh, and they it, it, it was a horrendous experience to to see these people trying to emote what they really felt and believed clearly coached by people from some other century and and my feeling is exactly in that moment what would have done these people so much better is no background sound uh, a, a mobile device in their hand walking down the line saying this is what we've been doing when we, when we just came back from vietnam where this stuff is made wow this is cool we're thrilled to be able to give jobs here we love that we have jobs here you know there's so much real human connection hmm. that would drive us a lot better than what we were raised on we were all raised on overly produced material but i think we don't want that anymore and i think that this is such a long answer to your question but i think that that's the answer i think the answer is that we really want clarity brevity a simplicity we want the uh, ability for what we feel is connection and then access um mm. And to your point about bigger company, bigger brand, the most successful people I've ever met, Sir Richard Branson, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, I'm blanking on his name. He ran part of Sun Microsystems. Huge, uh, both billionaires, both very accessible, both very uh, interested in connecting with people, both very interested in, in people. And, and I think that um, the only people who seem very busy and too busy to actually respond are people who aren't too busy. And I think, mm -hmm. Joanne, that, that comes from some strange perception that if we want to be successful, we have to pretend to be very busy. I'm, I'm, I'm not busy. I'm blessed. And so I think it's vital that we connect and show people our accessibility, not so that they can pester us with strange questions, but more so that they can say, this person stands with their product and their service, and this person believes these things, and I feel something when I hear them, and I want to be part of that. Yeah, I, I get what you mean there. And it's interesting because you, you said, uh, be clear what you stand for and have this, this clarity. And how, I mean, how do you manage that given that I've been following you for what, uh, eight, nearly eight years and obviously you were online way before I discovered you. How do you have clarity of what you're about over such a long time? Like how do you keep clarity with longevity or how do you change in the public eye? Both uh, related and great questions. I just I just noticed, by the way. Sorry, I looked up. I, I noticed that this very view from this hotel window, I could see the entire skyline of Boston. Uh, beautiful. Um, <laughs> the answer is they're very related. So so first off, I'm a big fan of the Madonna school of branding. Uh, Madonna has every single year been a whole new human being. And I don't know if it's calendar year. I don't know if she picks a certain date, like March fourth. I'll be a new Madonna, but she is different all the time. And I think that and Lady Gaga and a lot of musical performers know that they can't really be the old them all the time. And it, they can play their old songs, but they, they do need to evolve. And I think that this is true of all people. I think even authors, when they're writing their books, they have to evolve their writing. There has to be some kind of a, a, a through line, though. And this is the difference. So, so you can have lots of variations on how you express yourself. Uh, but should one take divergent paths all the time? I, you know, I love meat. Never mind. I just love green things. Oh no, meat's good again. You know, you're you're going to have a few challenges, right? Because uh, when you wave one flag and then the other, you're you're very you're stirring people to a choice that might align with theirs. And when you turn that corner, you may lose a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So my the old Chris Brogan, uh, and, 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 and until very recently was very fond of 90 degree turns, you know, well, let's, no, let's go over here. Mm -hmm. And I would lose so many people in that turn. And I would say, well, it's okay. I'll, I'll find new ones here. And that's a, that, it's a strategic choice. You could do that. Or you could say, well, this makes sense to me still, but I'm going here. You, you want to come with me? And so if you can make it a little more gradual, it helps. Mm -hmm. You have to stand for something, though, right? Uh, I believe that so I've said the same thing probably for 10 or more years, which is that what really drove my interest in business is how can we be more human? And then I turned that a little bit more directly to, I want companies to treat my mom better. And I feel like if all companies treated my mom better, 
Like, and if I just always thought with that in mind, I'd probably have a, a better way to work with companies. And mm-hmm. so I, uh, that's probably been the, the driving through line of everything I do is I, I'm always just thinking, what, what are we going to do to make a company do that sort of thing? So right now, mm-hmm. this really large auditing company asked me a question, um, corporate auditing type company, and they were talking about how do we make content marketing uh, that better aligns with search engine optimization? Now, I fell asleep right <laughs> away based on the question, but I think he's got a really good point because that this is what he's being told, right? I mean, this this gentleman is spending a lot of time reading on the web and you must be good at SEO. You must make good content marketing. What does that mean? <laughs> My answer back was, should we write for humans or should we write for robots? And I wrote a big article about um, my take is you have to please the Google um, but you have, still have to write for human beings. And so see, the, the language might change, some of the words might change, some of the emphasis of where I you know, look for someone's money in my business might change, but I'm still really doing the same thing. Please mm. make it better for my mom. Please make business run in a way that we treat humans like humans. And, and, and if you can find that one thing for your business, then you're golden. And it sometimes, by the way, one last point on this, Joanna, is it could take a decade or more. I mean, sometimes you just don't know. That doesn't mean don't get out there. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Little Drummer Boy school of thinking, which is uh, the song stripped of the religious part of that song. There's a new king in town. There's this poor kid there. He's like, everyone else is bringing gold. What the heck am I going to bring? And they're like, well, dummy, play your drum. And if you think about it, there's a little baby in a manger and someone drops off some gold and he's like, okay, well, it's shiny. That's cool. Frankincense and merges smell weird. Uh, but this guy drums, right? So the little kid's like, dude, ah, I like drums. I'm totally into drumming. I know what that is. And the kid loves it, right? That's the song, The Little Drummer Boy. We need to bring our drum, which might not seem like a lot, to everything until that we find that spot where someone goes, hey, I like your drum. And that's how we're going to win. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And it's great you mentioned the decade there because um, you did a video in October 2009 on what it takes to be an overnight success. And I've actually watched that a number of times over the years. And I wanted to tell you that. I know because you and for people, I'm going to link to it in the show notes, but you're basically getting in a lift and it's like five in the morning or half past four or something in and you're talking on the way to speaking. And it's affected me quite a lot because I'm like, every time I'm like, goodness, just nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening in my business? And then I'll watch that video and I go, look, look at the hustle. And I wanted to ask you, I guess, um, you know, the how did you keep it going? Like for people who are feeling right now that they're not a success and might be afraid of 10 years, um, you know, what are the things that kind of kept you getting up and doing the work? And, you know, was it just playing your drum or is there, you know, what drives you? So the we we have this strange problem, all humans, where when things aren't working, we look inside and we look at our belly buttons and we think the world hates us. We're not good enough. We are bad. Um, we're not mm-hmm. clever. Uh, everything is terrible. The people who have money, who, whose money we need, uh, aren't going around going, I wonder who out there feels depressed And I wonder who out there is looking for someone who doesn't feel quite good about themselves. I need to give them some money, right? That's not what they're thinking. I thought that's what they were thinking. And it turns out I've done a survey and all people say, nope, that's not how I spend my money. Mm -hmm. They have a challenge they need fixed. They have a solved problem waiting for you to be the answer to it. They're looking for, um, my boss just said I got to get better at this. I don't know how to get better at that, right? So every time I don't, last year financially was not a good year. Uh, we we did not hit our numbers, and by not hitting our numbers, sometimes I could not pay myself. Rob could not pay himself, and so you never hear successful people talk about this. They're they're always very successful. Yeah. Um, uh, my five Lamborghinis. I'm <laughs> sad because I can't paint them all a new color. I've only got the old color from last month. Um, I've got to cut back, right? Like that's how they talk. I have a denty old Camaro. It was beautiful in 2010 when I bought it. It was shiny, but I've hit a lot of things. Um, (laughs) So now it's denty. Um, But when I go, oh, I'm not making enough money, I I am prone to depression. So I I like to just go and lay in my bed and not ever get out of it when that happens. But I also haven't found any money in my bed yet. I'm not evidently a prostitute. I tried. Um, So instead, I have to go and help people. 
right? So when, with the overnight success and when you're failing, when you think, oh God, no one's ever gonna love me, the least attractive person at the bar is the person who thinks they're not attractive. Um, the most attractive person is the one uh, who already has all the attention and you know, so you can have some fun with that because you, we wrote about this in Trust Agents, we wrote this theory called the pretty girl at the bar. Uh, and I can tell you there's real life uh, experience behind it where we walked up to a really attractive woman and said, you know, I'm not gonna sleep with you. And then we just walked away. Now this is zero impact or conversation before this, and so we just go walk back to whatever we're doing, and the woman comes over and goes, what are you talking about? Why not? <laughs> it's in her head. It, well, why wouldn't you sleep with me? So suddenly now she's evaluating me as a sexual partner when th- th- it wasn't in her head, okay? So the, the concept of the story isn't to be a creepy guy hitting on random people. The concept uh, behind it is that you have to seem confident even when you're not. But the best way to seem confident is to help people. It's the little drummer boy again. It is you have to go out and find ways to help. If you are not making enough money, either you aren't offering something that people need, people don't know it's out there, mm. or you're not actually just knocking on doors saying, hey, does anyone want some of this? And I, I would say that a lot of our creative friends, Joanna, are horrendous at being a salesperson. Um, and they keep thinking that maybe, uh, I don't know, that magically people will come and buy. Mm. But to get better at anything, you have to do more of it. Right. And so my advice to anyone is try to learn how to sell better. And the first thing about learning to sell is to understand that you're exchanging a value uh, that's going to benefit somebody else and that there's, of course, going to be an exchange for that. And so don't go to try to sell to people who don't need what you sell. Do go to people and try to see if you could be helpful in some way. Do do your best to keep uh, refining your offering until people understand this is what I need. You know, I, I find a lot of people have very strange versions of what they think they're selling um, mm-hmm. and wonder why no one's buying. But, you know, I, I didn't know I needed a velocity coach. Right? <laughs> well, I'd, well, go faster. No, I did, that, that's not in my head as a, a challenge. Right. But maybe I do need a velocity coach. But maybe it's something different. Or maybe they haven't said to me, uh, if you could make your decisions faster, you'd make more money. Right. I mean, humans respond to, to two real basic things over and over again, uh, money and sex. You know, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough sex. And, and, and a good majority of everything we sell has one to do with one or the other. Right. You'd mm-hmm. be sexier if you could do this. Right. Thought leaders, <clears throat> people who want to be thought leaders. Horrible job title or, ter- or ter- <laughs> people who think they want that. What they're saying is I don't feel attractive, you know, and. and, and we, we obfuscate that in business terms, but that's what they're saying. And so I will make you more sexy, said in more businessy terms, is most definitely a better way to sell. And I think that that's what's behind the overnight success video. And I'm grateful that you watch it a lot. Um, I just watch it and say, what a horrible shirt. But <laughs> I'm grateful that you watch it. <laughs> well, I didn't even notice the shirt, to be fair. So don't worry about that. Um, but it's interesting. So you talk about self-doubt there and the sort of feeling like we're crap and but trying to be more confident. And you had a, a little book out recently, Find Your Writing Voice, um, which is actually the, the term writing voice is often something more associated with fiction authors than non fiction and I know you've dabbled with it in fiction um, but um, how do you define voice and how uh, you know can authors bring it in their work and in their marketing so the <clears throat> excuse me the evolution of that book came from uh, my fiance Jacqueline was working on some project and she like a lot of people uh, has that big disconnect between how they communicate about something they're interested in and how it ever lands on a page and I would say that the Number one problem with that is very similar to our previous conversation in that we look too much at our belly button. We worry when we write that everyone's judging us and that they're uh, going to, what are they going to say about me? And it it isn't untrue. We do judge readers, uh, writers, but most people are thinking very intensely with their what's in it for me. Uh, So the best way to, to do any kind of writing is to write in a way that really connects with the person you're hoping to serve. So In working on finding your writing voice, it's a lot of the same things I've talked about in many different methods, which is, you know, brevity, clarity, uh, simplicity, choosing phrasing and words that are not common um, because we we all speak in cliche. And there's just so much and so many times where you'll hear someone just slip in some other person's concept. And what happens 
even when we just talk about the weather or something, Joanna, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. It's sunny out. I didn't really ask, but okay. Right. So, um, yeah, unless you're, uh, you know, a sailboat captain, I mean, I guess that'd be a little more important, but when we use other people's language, we're shutting a whole chunk of our brain down because we're basically sending a robot message that someone else's mental robot knows how to respond to. And then there's just two robots talking. There's no in, a live conversation going on there. So I pay a lot of attention to that. I pay a lot of attention to in, in, in writing. Uh, we have to we have to write like we're actually talking to someone we love hmm. uh, instead of to a professor. We have to write as if we really want someone to take some action, right? This is a this is a long-standing theme of mine, is that we can write for thought, or we can write for action. And it's great to have thinking books. You and I read so often. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I just read a book. It was by my ninth-grade history professor. It's called One Second After, and it's um, it's about if an electromagnetic pulse wiped out everything electronic in the U.S. Then what? Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a, a, a it's a terrifying book in a lot of ways because it's a quite viable thing that could happen. And he just points out how absolutely unprepared uh, this country and all the countries are for that possibility. And um, But the book also prompts action. It makes you think, hmm, all right, well, that being what it is, what would I do differently in my life today to, to even be marginally prepared for it. What plan would I have, you know, if this kind of a problem happened? You know, at least I've thought it through, but but there's action behind it. So that's, it, action is important to me in a writing voice. The other detail is, I think we, it, it's so strange that we all try, try to be yourself. No one knows how to be themselves. Copy the hell out of someone. Copy someone to death. Um, uh, Erica Napolitano has a line, um, copy and steal everything case it's the case method right we all learn from robbing from some other author you know and then from that though learn what makes it your writing break it apart i mean it's it, <laughs> i was in linkedin a moment ago and i just saw that someone's tagline on their linkedin you know how there's that one sentence yeah, yeah. That was exactly my line at chrisbrogan.com <laughs> like like in the same order all the word and i was like oh great tagline i wrote him <laughs> Because that's a little, that's not quite what I'm getting at here. But I'm glad I motivated him to choose my exact sentence for his tagline on his LinkedIn. I think it's a great, noble choice. That's why I picked it. That's why I thought it was a good thing to serve. But once we get past that, find what makes it ours, you know. And and what makes it ours might be our, our lifestyle choice, our views, our, you know. Uh, I want to write, uh, I want to write a book about uh, if... If Britain had won the American Revolution, then what? You know, and then I might have to think through why would I want to write that book? And maybe because of the military aspect, or you know, what would be different over here? You know, I, I don't know. So to me, it's the guts of it are clarity, brevity, a, a choice for action, looking for non-robot writing, and most especially trying to take what you've learned forward into a, a viewpoint that you can make your own and that people can connect with. Mm. No, that's great. And yes, we're talking about modelling, not plagiarism. And um, I should also say, you know, uh, as I said, back in 2009, when I discovered you, I modelled my website back then on chrisbrogan.com. I actually went and got Studio Press and all of that. And But of course, my face is not your face. My colour scheme was not your colour scheme, but the structure, you know, and I always say to people now, please model, you know, based on my site if you want to. Like, and, and what you're saying is we, we're inviting that, aren't we? We're inviting yeah. modeling just not plagiarism true, true. <laughs> um okay so in um the freak shall inherit the earth another one of your many books um you say make it your business to find the people who are the same kind of freak as you and then serve them so people obviously might get a bit freaked out by the word freak what what do you mean by that so I can tell you that that was one of my least successful books ever published. I can tell you that nearly no one bought it. I read it and bought it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, China, strangely. Many Chinese people bought the book. And uh, the title is a little different over there. I don't remember how exactly it is, but it's I think they use the word strange or something. My point of using the word freak, and I, I revel in the concept, is that 
we've been taught that business should be the same. We should all be the same. It's an industrialized world. Let's all be cogs in a factory uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it really started breaking down perhaps in the 1990s, but it took the world another 20 years to realize it didn't work. Um, many systems today are still built around that concept. School, public school, is built around the notion that all of our children uh, should be taught to work in factories or cubicles. And neither really have a space for them anymore. Right? In the U.S., there's hardly any manufacturing jobs. And there are big, huge office buildings in New York City that only have maybe two or three floors worth of people. All, everyone else is in a different environment now. Yeah. Um, but business, when they, especially when they try to market, they try really hard to reach everybody. You know, and I'm drinking this daily greens. That's why it's my example, because it's near me. The kind of people who drink green drinks are not the kind of people necessarily who drink Diet Coke um, they, or they're the kind of people who maybe don't go to McDonald's, whatever it is. But if you're McDonald's, you don't really you, you don't go after the green drink person. I mean, McDonald's in the States is going after, you're a busy parent, we've got these great coffee drinks now, you should come here because it's just like Starbucks, except it costs less, and you're probably coming here to get your kids their nuggets or whatever, you might as well get yourself a fancy coffee. That's how they market it. And it, and it works because their freaks are the kind of parents who maybe don't value Starbucks, let's say. And I think that in marketing, we've been taught how do we reach everybody, and I don't think it's the right answer. I, I, I think the person who wants to drive a Mini Cooper is not the person who wants to drive a Land Rover. I think they're just two different entities and we have to sell to them in different ways. And I think that in all life, we should really start to gather around us the people who we'd most want to have beverages with, who we'd most want to uh, talk with when we're not talking business. I go to a bunch of marketing type conferences throughout the year and in a lot of cases, I am surrounded by wonderful people who I wouldn't really want to talk with much. Uh, I'll just say it, right? And the reason isn't that there's nothing wrong with them, but they're like, gee whiz, Google Analytics is great. <laughs> and, and yes, it is. Yeah. How's your dog, right? So um, when I go to these conferences, I've done so much pre-work to make it clear that I love Batman, I love video games, I love nerdy superhero things, because I would so much rather have a conversation of why was Batman versus Superman such a terrible movie? Mm -hmm. uh, what could they have done? Then I would, uh, do you think Snapchat is great? Mm -hmm. Answer, no. Uh, well, or do you think it's great, bad because you're an old man? Answer probably. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I, I think Snapchat's bad because I can't click anything, right? I can't make a marketer go do something. So we have to start using the tools better, and we have to use the tools to reach the specific person we want to reach. And with calling all freaks, with the freaks shall inherit the earth, I really wanted people to say, I'm this weird and this quirky in this way, and I want to find you who are like me because it's so much easier to work with people who like us and we do business best with the people we tend to want to buy from people who we consider like us. Uh, I read an interview about this in the 1990s in high tech because uh, people with Linux uh, operating system were having such a hard time selling because Linux, uh, you think nerds, you think uh, suspenders and big beards and, and dandruff and things. You don't think sexy sleek and, and Apple runs above Linux and it makes it look sexy, sleek, and arty. So now if you're an Apple person, you must be amazing. Mm. I think that it's such an ideal time to unseat that. Like it's such a great time for someone like Lenovo to come along and say, we're not at all fancy like that. We just work really well and you should probably buy us. And that's the message, Joanna. It's not you've got to be some kind of weirdo. I, I say really early in that book, mm. you don't have to have any certain number of piercings to be in this club. You just have to find the people who you think are like you. Hmm. It's funny you say it because, again, I've been sharing over the... Well, I didn't used to share it, but I share it regularly now, especially when I speak, that I really like graveyards. And ah. I love walking around graveyards. Do you like graveyards? I do. I do. And uh, I spent a good deal of my... Uh, what in America would be our high school years, you know, 15 through 18 in a graveyard. 
<laughs> there you go. And so when I say that, I say, who else likes them? And probably a third of the people will always put their hands up. And I'm like, you know, you're my peeps. And if you like that, you might like my fiction because that's about the only way I can do it. So that's I, I really love the book. But on a book marketing topic, do you think that that didn't sell because of the title? Like you should not have used the word freak in the title. I think there are two major uh, problems with the book marketing uh, and all mine. The word freaks was bad. And ter- it turns out businesses don't understand that the term entrepreneurship for a bigger company means innovation. So all bigger companies want innovation. They, they say. Mm-hmm. They actually don't. But let's get back to that. But they don't understand that that word is a synonym. So entrepreneurship and innovation mean the same thing. Entrepreneurship is essentially accepting risk to go after a reward, usually in creation of a marketplace that didn't immediately exist. That's entrepreneurship. Innovation is uh, t- looking at new perspectives and new avenues and new product lines of challenges in a, in, in a platform that maybe does or doesn't exist and then uh, f- retooling part of the industry and business to a- accommodate that. Mm. It's the same thing, right? But I wrote the word entrepreneurship. So if you ran uh, Cisco systems or something, you went Pasha and threw it away and looked at a book called, you know, sales factors for large companies, um, you know, grown up words. And uh, I think a lot of people didn't want to be called a freak. Mm. And I think that not unlike gay people really like the word queer, they wanted to take it back. Uh, the uh, African American culture likes the N word. I think that there's a, a, a power in taking back a word like freak. But uh, maybe I'm early. Maybe I'm early to this this rally cry. And I think my freak friends and weirdos like yourself who mm-hmm. like grave, you know, oh, me, that's me. Um, I like events like that. There's the Misfit Conference. There's the World Domination Summit. There's all these conferences where people with purple hair go. And that's partly to whom I wrote the book. I also wrote it very specifically. I wrote it for my kids, by the way. Um, my kids are both weirdos and they'll never have a normal job. And so I said, look, here's a book for people who will never have a normal job. I felt like there's so many entrepreneurship books with a white man in a suit shaking hands with another white man or maybe a woman, let's get the verse, um, in a suit that it doesn't speak to them. And you know, a kid that I went to school with, he launched something called the Big Gay Ice Cream Company. Um, and he did it. He was a bassoonist for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. He took some time off. Well, I guess they have the summers off. I guess you don't bassoon in the summer. I, I don't know. And he wanted to uh, drive an ice cream truck around New York City. He thought it would be fun. But he thought their product was gross. And so he said, I bet I can make ice cream. Mm-hmm. And so he did. And he, he built an ice cream truck and he went out and he sold weird things like the B. Arthur. And, and all these names that didn't make sense. And he would put uh, olive oil and salt on top of the ice cream. And people would say, oh, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. It's turned into three or four different restaurants now. He's got quite a following. Uh, very big celebrities like his ice cream. There's a Marvel comic that had a big gay ice cream shirt on one of the characters. Just just happens in the background. Um, that guy did not think I'm going to be an entrepreneur. You know, He just said, I want to do it different than everyone else did. And that's to whom I wrote the book. And of course, it worked really well for weirdos who saw themselves in it. But I think in a larger book marketing sense, um, it was not ever bound to be the mainstream because it didn't say, boy, you're going to be rich or sexy or both. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because, of course, uh, Seth Godin had All Marketers Are Liars, and I think he ended up retitling that book. Um, and he also has one called We Are All Weird, which has an awful cover as well. Like, your cover was awesome, and his cover was terrible. And I was like, Seth, man, I mean, you know, th- th- there are so many things. But I wondered, because you have traditionally published books, and you have self-published books. Um, the uh, one on writing voice was self-published, I believe, and your next one, Make Your Own Game, I believe, is traditionally published right so yeah. what's your and as an entrepreneur um what do, what is your feeling about the current um market in publishing and what are the, when do you self-publish and when do you traditionally publish the number one reason i prefer or appreciate self-publishing is that i really don't need anyone's permission i can do my work i can put it out there's a book have a nice day the reason i like traditional publishing and most especially my friends at wiley I'm friends uh, with the people that I publish through there uh, socially. I mean, we'll go in and get a beverage sometimes. And I'm not their favorite author because I don't make them a ton of money, but I, I'm, they like to have drinks with me, I guess. So um, I like doing it because it lets me work with friends. Uh, the other thing I like, though, is that in a traditional published 
book. Uh, they have distribution channels that I don't have. It's quite easier to get a book on a shelf somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, uh, for the longest time, at least me, but I, I think it's a somewhat industry truth, digital is far outstripped um, – digital uh, sales channels have far outstripped physical traditional channels to the point of like 96 percent to four or something so my wanting to see my book on a shelf at my local bookstore um there's only four percent of the market so i should care less Hmm. and yet i think that there's a beauty in having a nice well-bound well-made and as as beautiful as create space is it delivering it's certainly not a quality feeling type book and i think sometimes the tactile sense of having a well published book you know a good looking book is is worth something the art of it uh, the other thing i like is that I, I do like having sort of the external pressure uh, of having a deadline and having people bothering me um people misunderstand and think that the editing process at a book publisher is guaranteed to be very intense. Uh, it's not. Um, and I've had really intense editors who really pushed me to make a better book. And I've had editors who have let me put as many typos as I could possibly fit on a page into a book. Um, my fiance is my first reader all the time and she clears up a lot of mistakes and messes for me. Uh, I'm a very bad editor, a very, very bad editor. Um, and, and I guess that the, how do I decide? I mean, this one, I, a couple years ago, my friend Matt said, you know, you should, we should do a book. It'll be fun. And I said, ah, okay. And that's really all I did. Mm-hmm. In between that, I self-published Find Your Writing Voice. And I have to, I actually have another whole one about email just sitting there waiting. And then I've got another other one. Uh, and then I'm planning to do some fiction, I, I think. And so in those experiences, I'll choose to self-publish because I just don't want the process of someone else deciding yes or no. It took me two years to put Make Your Own Game out because when I went the first time, you you submit a proposal every time. Stephen King submits proposals, mm-hmm. you know, and they, uh, my editor, uh, my acquisitions editor fought me and didn't like what my, my proposal and had the numbers for freaks to say, you're probably bad. Mm-hmm. And I and I had enough low self-esteem to say, you're right, I'm probably bad. And I sort of let her uh, alter the course in the direction of this, the way this book was going to be. And then when I looked at it again a few months into the process, I said, I'm not going to write this. I would never read this book. Mm. And it really took turned me off for a year plus, Joanna. So it's such a long story, but I think it's important because uh, when I came back to them, I said, look, I'm not going to write that book. You know, it's clear a year has gone by. I missed every deadline and re-deadline that you ever came up with. Here's the book I'm willing to write. What do you think? And, all, and I said, this is not a threat, but it's kind of all or nothing. You could say yes, or you could say no, but this is the deal. And I said, okay. And uh, it's going to be a great book. It, it's, I never say that about my writing. Uh, the last time I did it was Freaks and no one bought it. Um, but I'll tell you that um, this sums a lot of the things like the overnight success kind of principle into one space. And it was an echo of trust agents because the first tr- tenet of a trust agent was to make your own game. So I thought, huh, I'll just steal from that book and write a whole new one. And that's the point. Yeah, and I guess you're using your your freak love of games, right? You're you like you are a gamer, so you're bringing that to the book, and that's such an important point, I guess. I wanted to justify the fact that I play so many video game hours in a day. I, I, I think that's the only reason I'm doing that. I, you know, but you know, the thing is, you and I both know that there are so many people who never do anything or take no uh, effort because they might fail. The one thing video games and video games more than other games like poker might be true too. You fail a lot in video games. You know, Tetris, there's no winning Tetris. You know, you just get to a level where you can't sustain it anymore. And you go, oh, I'm done. Right. We never we never win Candy Crush. We get so far and then we stop. Um, And I think that teaching, for instance, the repetitive nature of failure, you know, fail, 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 fail. Oh, I have some new ideas. Oh, try that. Oh, better. Failed again. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that there's beauty in that, that people don't really uh, incorporate enough. I think iterative processes, strategic thinking, um, velocity of response, are, these are all things that are built into any video game, um, and it doesn't matter which type you play. I play shooters and, and somewhat violent games, um, but if you asked me, are you in it for the blood, I don't even notice the blood. I, I am in it to see if I can aim better than the other guy sometimes, or does my strategy get me closer to the victory than the other guy? And And I think that 
a lot of that translates to business and a lot of that translates to modern business. And I think that um, in a world where we're using all these older methods of trying to move stuff forward, we need some new tools. And I, my opinion is that if you can treat business and life as a game, you can understand better scoring, ways to win a little bit better. Mm. I think that you know there's a lot to understand about how we use media in this new world. And I, I can pull from that. And so this one, I think, I, I don't know. I, I Everything from designing the cover forward, I'm really trying to make it like a business person is going to go, all right, I'll give you a try, you weirdo. And hopefully, you know, I've hidden the broccoli well enough inside the cake that they're going to think it's a delicious cake. We'll see. <laughs> well, um, I'm looking forward to that. So last question, um, back in Freaks, which I obviously really liked, um, you say, uh, you will not inherit the earth, nor will you be successful at anything if you can't figure out and master time. And given what you were just saying about how much time you play video games um, and how many hours, like writers, writers always say, oh, I, I just can't find the time to write. So how do you master and hack your time to get so much time? on i have a system that i created and uh stole a little from my coworker rob hat we made it something up called the 20 minute plan jump start and it's essentially our biggest premise is that one must manage priorities more than they manage time time is a finite and set number there's only 24 hours in the day gandhi said that you know we can all use them however we choose so what I've done in the 20 minute plan is there's this concept called the nine box. And the nine box is essentially if you drew the front side of a Rubik's cube, you three columns, three rows, nine of something, it's three hours broken into 20 minute slots. And that's why it's the 20 minute plan, right? So in those three hours, I, I have, a, and it's not with me because I'm at a hotel, but I have a real live old timey ladybug timer. Hmm. She looks like a ladybug and it tick, 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 ding, it goes off. I schedule my time in 20 minute slots to work on those things that grow my business or grow my success. So I must accomplish three hours of this a day, uh, else I've failed. That's my game. My game is if I don't do my three hours, then I've failed. And some of that is prospecting. Some of that is trying to, uh, how do I grow my business is the real question. So I have missions and goals that I've set up and I say, oh, well, will this advance my mission or goal? Yes, it goes in this box. Not client work, not to-do list. I don't believe in to-do lists. Uh, I think to-do lists are what I call noble masturbation. Um, we get it all done and we go, oh, I finished. Oh. But it's not sex. It's You, you did something, but you, you, when you die and if you visit St. Peter or you know, Buddha says, okay, here's your next round. Let's go. They don't look at your to-do list as, as, a, as a document of value. They don't say, well, thank God you took out that trash you said you were going to take out. <laughs> They don't say, whoa, you sent that post that you were supposed to send four days back, right? No one cares, right? So I prioritize priority. It's a weird thought, but maybe if we worked on the things that mattered most, some of those things that are kind of urgent, that might be fall down, that maybe you get a late fee on your bill because you didn't pay the bill, it's going to happen. You'll be okay. You're going to live. You're not going to die. Um, and so – prioritizing gives me time to play things like video games. I, I, I spent an hour of my day so far prospecting in LinkedIn, looking for business clients and a very gentle approach, nothing too intense, just some messages, just getting some feel for where people are going. And out pops this guy saying, hey, maybe you've got this thing. That will turn into 40, 50, $60,000 worth of business. And it was for me spending some of my time on my nine box just doing one activity that I thought might give me some potential business. And there it was, right? So if you, in one of your 20 minute slots did something that earned you $50,000, you might do it again. You might go, wow, now that was good. That's sex. That's, that's not noble masturbation, right? So I think that in uh, playing the games, I keep pretending that I'm justifying this because I'm writing a book. It's not true. I just like games, but, um, I earn that time because I also don't spend my time getting cups of coffee where people pick my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I drink zero coffee with Brain Picker. That time is my video game time. Mm. I do not go to every conference. I go to the conferences I think where I might add value or I might pick up value, right? That's my video game time. I do not go out and speak at events for free because I'm a paid professional speaker. And so sometimes though that might be nice for some nice people. 
that's my video game time. So I have lots of time, and so does every other person. Authors who say they don't have time are authors who are saying yes to things they shouldn't, right? Because if, if writing mattered, you, then that's your priority and you make the time. Oh, but I have children. Me too, right? You know, oh, but I have work. Me too. You know, I fly. Me too. But, you know, maybe you're playing Sudoku in the airport and maybe I'm writing notes that are going to be into the next chapter, right? I think that we all can choose where we want to spend our time. And I think that if part of that, and it, the other thing is if we choose to work on processes and, 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 and execution that makes us the money we need, if you don't value your time to put the right amount of money against it, and if you don't bill appropriately, and if you don't follow up on people who don't pay the bill, and all those things that new entrepreneurs are horrible at, then of course you don't have time hmm. because you're, you're bleeding money uh, from the way you're using your existing time. And I think we can all find better ways to pick that up. And one is just being a lot more true to your priorities. Fantastic. And I appreciate your time today. So tell people where they can find you and all your books and products and wonderful things online. Uh, you know, if you can spell Chris Brogan, then that's fine. If you just Google Chris, I'm usually in the first few answers. I don't I, because I'm a blatherer, not because of any great trick. I'm not friends with Google um, or just owner dot media if you don't know. But thank you, Joanna. It, it's been so overdue this conversation. So thank you for allowing me to chat with you today. Oh, thanks so much, Chris. That was great.